Hey, a bit Steve, that old Yorkshire geek, and a bit of Star Wars news for you. Uh, this is from Forbes, Carolyn Reed, reporting uh, about that Star Wars The Rise of Palpatine um, didn't cost as much as Disney expected it to, even though it did cost a hell of a lot of money. But uh, anyway, before we start, don't forget to like and subscribe, share the videos, drop a comment, hit the notification bell if you subscribed already. Uh, explore the description for links from my social medias and Patreon and merch and other stuff. Um, so have fun in there. Right, so um, let's have a read of this article from Forbes, shall we? I haven't read it all. I've, I've skimmed it and I think it goes into quite a lot of detail. <laughs> so it might be a bit technical for my stupid brain to understand. But anyway, or maybe they just get it all wrong. We'll see, won't we? So off we go. Let's have a look. Right, there it is from Forbes. Disney reveals Star Wars The Rise of Palpatine, I won't call it The Rise of Skywalker, was below budget. Carolyn Reed covers the entertainment industry, she says, and there's some uh, stormtroopers in the London Eye uh, above the Houses of Parliament there. There's uh, the Queen Elizabeth Tower. Used to be called St Stephen's Tower, but they changed the name. Uh, which houses Big Ben, which is the bell within. Right, everybody knows that, don't they? Right, off we go. The idea of saving money on a movie which cost hundreds of millions of dollars to make sounds bizarre, to say the least. However, that is precisely what Disney says it did on 2019 Star Wars Episode Nine: The Rise of Palpatine. Because it was, you know, no Rise of Skywalker in it. Uh, she was a Palpatine. Just saying you're a Skywalker does not make it so. In, in in that sense, then I am I am I am Steve Churchill because I'm I'm decided I'm going to be like Winston Churchill. I'm, I look like him in my rotund ma manner, but anyway, it isn't exaggerating. Analysis of recently filed documents reveals that by March 2019, one month after filming wrapped. Disney said the movie was in line with the budget. Uh, however, post-production cost less than expected. And by the end of the year, less than two weeks after the movie debuted, Disney disclosed that was below the production budget. I don't know if they mention marketing in this article. As I said, I've skimmed through it. And I, I didn't notice. They might do, but I didn't notice any mention of marketing. And later on they talk about a 50-50 split, which is not quite accurate but anyway that's despite the movie having total costs of 588.2 million dollars or 442.2 million pounds it isn't actually as bizarre as it sounds it is important to stress at the outset that there is a distinct difference between the cost or spending on the movie and its budget these terms are often used interchangeably even by trade titles but that is far from correct Contrarily to popular belief, the budget isn't the amount that the movie cost to make. If it was, it wouldn't be possible for a movie to be over or under budget. In fact, the budget is the amount that the studio allocated to it on its internal forecasts. The movie's cost is the sum that was actually spent on it. If this exceeds the budget, then the studio has to adjust its forecasts as further funds need to be allocated to it in order for production to continue. So, that's it. Maybe they said... Uh, the budget for Rise of Palpatine is going to be $500 million. Um, and if it cost $600 million to make it, we're over budget. If it cost $400 million to make it, we're under budget, for instance. But that doesn't include marketing costs, I don't think. I don't think they include marketing costs in the budget. Anyway. Uh, this is usually due to unforeseen circumstances, uh, such as the directors being dropped, which is what happened on Solo, A Star Wars Story. In scenarios like this, studios usually have to pay a severance fee to the former director and hire a new one, uh, possibly for an increased fee, both of which are unexpected costs that can lead to the picture ending up going over budget, as was the case with Solo, and it lost money. But then again, I think some of the others... I think Rise of Palpatine lost money, even though this article says it didn't. But again, marketing, they don't take that into account. However, the reverse is also possible as studios can make unexpected savings during production, uh, which lead them to spending less, uh, sorry, which lead to them spending less than expected. This principle can apply at any level of spending. Uh, 
For example, if a studio allocates $500 million to a movie in its internal forecasts but only ends up spending $450 million, it comes in under budget, even though $450 million is still a staggering sum, which may indeed be more than, any, uh, more than other movies of its kind cost to make. Uh, there are a number of reasons why a picture can come in under budget, with two being the emergence of new technologies and economies of scale. As we have reported, LED screens have recently become a viable alternative to shooting on location, and if the decision to use them is made during production, it can cut costs unexpectedly. That's, you know, like the volume, you know, the big screens that they have around. Uh, but I, st I still think there needs still a lot of tinkering uh, with in post-production. Um, I don't think they could just. Sh they don't. I don't think they just shoot on it, and it's just there in the background. I think that there is some faffing goes on in post production, because if you look at them when when you see them shooting, you know you see like behind the scenes, that screen is not. It doesn't look good enough to me for movie quality, um, images, and it, and it often seems disjointed as well. There seems to be like jumps in the. In the image that's on the screen so but anyway unless they've improved it since then but anyway uh, likewise if a studio's visual effects division realizes during production that it can reuse character designs from previous films rather than creating new ones the economies of scale can have the same effect um, such as standing sets uh, if you build a, a huge set uh, for a movie um, for instance the base, the Battle of Yavin base, you know, the, the big set, the big opening there, that they used in Rogue One, uh, they could reuse that again uh, in another film, and it, it wouldn't cost as much, obviously, to build it from scratch, that's sort, that sort of thing. Uh, although the reason for the rise of uh, no one really said it, the rise of Palpatine's cost being lower than expected isn't certain. It coincided with the editing of the movie, which took less time than usual. This came to light. Are you sure? Uh, because there were talk of there being a lot of editing going on with this film uh, and various cuts. Some people even saying there were a George Lucas cut, which is total nonsense, but anyway. Uh, this came to light in an interview on the Rough Cut podcast with the rise of Palpatine's editor Marion Brandon, who admitted that the latter stages of the production schedule were accelerated, which affected everything. She estimated that the crew had three months less to work on The Rise of Palpatine than The Force Awakens, the first of Disney's Star Wars trilogy, which I still do like. I still like The Force Awakens, even though it does have huge problems. Uh, but I still kind of enjoy it. Brandon explained that the reason for the tight timing was that Disney insisted on sticking to the movie's December 2019 release date rather than delaying it, which would have increased the post-production time and therefore the cost. Uh, so that's just a saving in time, time equals money sort of thing, isn't it? Uh, reshoots are often planned into budgets, but J.J. Abrams, the director of The Rise of Palpatine, told Entertainment Weekly that the movie ended up needing fewer than The Force Awakens. Fewer what? Oh, reshoots, sorry. <laughs> what we're on about then. Um, he explained that because The Force Awakens was the first movie in the series, uh, we didn't know if these characters would work, if the actors would be able to carry a Star Wars movie. There were a lot of things we didn't know. On the rise of Palpatine, we knew who and what worked. Um, no, he didn't. <laughs> because it was a terrible movie. It was a comedy. Anyway, for instance, in The Force Awakens... Um, I forgot his bloody name now. Uh, Oscar Isaac's character, uh, Poe Dameron. Um, he was supposed to die uh, early on in the film. You know, when the, the TIE fighter crashed and sank into the sand. He was supposed to die. And then they decided that they liked the character so much that they were going to bring him back. And, you know. Uh, so that that's uh, an instance of changes and reshoots happening. Uh, I don't know if they actually did any reshoots, but maybe it was just changed in time to work it into the. the, the shooting schedule that you know um, primary shooting schedule i don't know but anyway the cast of the rise of skywalker reads like a roll call for the oscars uh, not oscar Isaac. Um, uh, rise, did i say rise of skywalker then obviously i meant rise of palpatine reads like a roll call for the oscars it included original stars mark hamill and carrie fisher uh, with e Oh, ah, yes, he appeared as a force ghost, didn't he? Did he? Yes, he did, yes. 
I'm trying to think about Mark Campbell up here, but yes. Uh, with Ian McDermid, who played their adversary, the evil Emperor, because somehow he returned. In the original Star Wars movies, nearly 40 years earlier, in The Rise of Palpatine, he teams up with Adam Driver's Kylo Ren to take on the remnants of the Resistance, with Daisy Ridley, John Boyega and Oscar Isaac in the leading roles, and there's Mark Hamill, the insane Mark Hamill. I can say that. He's now, anyway, uh, as young Luke Skywalker in the original Star Wars, and there's his land speeder in the background. Obviously with its repulsor lifts turned off. <laughs> For Disney, the reduced reshoots and the accelerated post-production process was a force for good. If the movie had cost more to make, the studio's profit would have been lower. I don't think there were any profit. And there's no need to speculate about that. Are you just brushing that under the carpet, are you, Carolyn? The budgets of movies made in the United States are usually a closely guarded secret as studios tend to combine their spending on the individual pictures into their overall expenses and don't itemise the budgets of each one. However, as we have often reported, productions filmed in the United Kingdom had exceptions to this and The Rise of Palpatine was one of them. The Rise of Palpatine made use of eight sound stages and two backlots at Pinewood Studios just outside London. I don't know if it's just outside. That's American, isn't it? They said Leeds is just outside London, but it's like, I believe 150 miles away. But anyway, um, as well as filming on location, a former Royal Air Force hangar, originally built in 1915 to house airships for the First World War, doubled for the deck of a Star Destroyer in the film's final battle with the Emperor. They were riding horses on it, or space horses. Because for some reason, J.J. Abrams doesn't like things in space. I don't know why. He doesn't like seeing spaceships in space, or very little. <sighs> Where were we? Uh, the hangar was also home to Christopher Nolan's Batman series as well as Justice League, Inception and Harry Potter spin-off, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. It was even used to film sets, uh, to film scenes set on the Resistance planet of Yavin in the original Star Wars movie in 1977. Shooting in the UK shines a spotlight on the finances of films, studios which make movies there benefit from its audio-visual expenditure credit. Uh, I presume they took all that AVEC or something, I don't know. Which gives them a cash reimbursement of up to 25.5% of the money they spend in the country. So... Don't mean they get 25% of the entire budget back, just what they spend, you know, there while they're actually filming there. Uh, which could still be a lot of money. Uh, to qualify for the reimbursement, movies must pass a points test based on factors such as how many members of the production team are from the UK and how much of the post-production work is done in the UK. Furthermore, at least 10% of the core costs of the production need to relate to activities in the UK and in order to demonstrate this to the government, studios set up a separate film, co film production company, FPC, there for each picture. It's all very complicated. <laughs> I was like, my stupid brain can't handle it. Uh, which is why I'm not a businessman at all. The companies usually have code names so that they don't raise attention with fans when filing for permits to film on location. Uh, through industry research, the company names can be tallied with the names of the productions they're responsible for with Disney's subsidiary, Carbonado Industries UK, being the one behind the rise of Palpatine. Uh, the production companies have to file annual financial statements which reveal everything from the total costs of the movie right down to the headcount, salaries and even the social security payments for staff. However, marketing costs are not shown on the financial statements. There we go. So they did mention marketing. As they tend to be covered directly by the bye bye the studio. Uh, likewise, revenue from theatre ticket sales, merchandise and home entertainment also goes directly to the studio. Uh, the financial statements are just for the company which makes the movie and studios file them in stages. This starts during pre-production and goes on long after the premiere to give the company time to ensure it has collected all of its bills and received the money for them. It can take a great deal of time for the company to ensure that all invoices have been paid. This explains why the 2018 financial statements for the production company behind Star Wars spin-off Rogue One 
stated that the company was involved in paying the ongoing production costs in relation to the film, even though it was re released two years earlier. Let's have a little drinky. Of me cold coffee. This means that the cost of a production can still rise years after release, though not usually by anywhere near as much as when it was being made. It's like interest and stuff like that, I suppose. Five years after the rise of Palpatine, that was close, was released, Carbonado Industries UK is still booking costs on its financial statements and just over a month ago filed its latest results. Disney and its Lucasfilm division, which owns the rights to Star Wars, did not respond to a request to comment. They don't need to, as the filings do the talking. Right, Rise of Palpatine. So, did, so is that what it looked like? Some A table with all nice colours? You'd think it'd just be a sheet of paper, wouldn't it? It was numbered on, but anyway. Pardon me. There you go, revenue from studios. That's the budget that the studio agreed on. 485 million 666 dun 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 $1,605. And then there goes various uh, miscellaneous income, $36,000. Don't know where that comes from, but it's miscellaneous. Uh, and this is the, the outgoings, costs. Um, right, so here we go. Wages and salaries. Call it $31 million. Social security costs, just under $4 million. Production costs, that's pretty much everything else, isn't it? Uh, $551.5 million. So that's already more than what the, the the budget allowed by the studio. So total costs, $588,185,475. Pre-tax loss, 102 Um uh, million, uh, 102 and a half million dollars, uh, but luckily <laughs> they got a tax credit. So thanks to the UK's uh, tax credit, they got that money back almost exactly, uh, apart from 111,665 dollars. So if that they got that tax credit, the money, the movie would have lost money right away. Uh, but it still lost bloody money. Um, you can't say that's you can't claim you've got you've made a profit on getting the tax credit back. Anyway, oh uh, dear. Right, so, the latest financial statements show that by December 31st, 2023, the total cost of the rise of Palpatine had hit at $588.2 million, but it doesn't stop there. Disney also banked a $102.6 million, £77 million, reimbursement from the UK government, bringing its net spending on the rise of Palpatine down to $485.6 million. It is important to stress that this figure isn't an, isn't an accounting sum, a forecast or an estimate. It's a precise figure based on the $588.2 million that Lucasfilm actually spent minus the $102.6 million cash reimbursement that was actually received. $102 million cash back. Tax back, essentially, isn't it? Tax rebates, what it is, isn't it? The certainty of the data is why our reports focus on the production costs of the movies rather than their marketing costs or merchandise and home entertainment revenues. This should include marketing costs, though, because that is an important thing. Any data about these costs and revenue streams can only be an estimate at best. True, true. Uh, and there is not, e and not even an independent archive of them, as there is, as there is with as there is with theatre ticket sales, thanks to industry analyst Box Office Mojo. Uh, yes, because they just guess marketing costs. Um, that's why they usually say it, it's it's in the threes. Um, one third uh, is the production cost, one third marketing, and then one third ticket sales. Um, that's uh, that's the, you know the third what they go with. Um, no, not one third, but. That's what they split it into. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, so that so that's what they say. so the movie needs to make three times um, the production cost to to make a profit because you've got to take into account marketing, which is like another third of the production cost, um, and then ticket sales, which it can vary depending where you are in the world. From like you know 50% of the the tickets um, revenue to like 
like in China, I think it's like a quarter, 25 percent of the the ticket sales. So it, it, I say, it's not accurate, but you can you can you know make a, a pretty good stab at uh, how much money a movie makes or doesn't make. Anyway, where were we? Um, guaranteeing the accuracy of the data is just the start. UK law states. Uh, is there a link there? Is there a state there? So you can follow that link. That the production company must be responsible for pre-production, principal photography and post-production of the movie or programme uh, and delivery of the film or programme in completed form. It adds that the company directly negotiates, contracts and pays for rights, goods and services in relation to the film or programme. In short, UK law requires the production company to bear the complete cost of the production so its financial statements legally cannot just give part of the picture and also have to be true and accurate. Quote. <laughs> That's what this should be, isn't it? Accordingly, any indication that the data justifying our reports is inaccurate or incomplete could cause serious legal problems for the studio, and there is no suggestion here that they have anything to worry about. The legal requirement for truth and accuracy in the financial statements give the, gives the movie costs a seal of approval, as the studio cannot deny them. Studios put up with this level of disclosure due to the size of the reimbursements on offer. Well, that's over 100 hundred and something million dollars, wasn't it? Uh, getting them requires some financial wizardry, which begins at the very start of production. Right, so we're going to get all technical now, maybe. I don't know, but here we go. The first step usually sees the Hollywood studio buying a script from a screenwriter and giving the green light to a movie about it. If the studio decides to make the movie in the UK, it then sets up a subsidiary company there, which acquires the script from its US-based parent. Acquiring the script gives the UK company the right to make a movie about it and the Hollywood studio usually pays it a small production services fee. As the law says, the UK company must be responsible for everything from pre-production and principal photography to post-production, delivery of the finished film and payment of goods and services in relation to it. Next comes the financial wizardry. If the UK company makes a profit, the benefit from the UK government comes in the form of a reduction to its tax bill. However, if it makes a loss, it receives a cash reimbursement, so studios fund the companies in a way which engineers this. So it's jiggery-pokery, isn't it? As shown in the diagram below, the studio buys the rights to the film from the UK company but only gives it up to 74.5% of the projected production cost. The remaining 25.5% is provided by the studio in the form of a loan. It's all very dodgy if you ask me, even though it's probably legal. The loan and the revenue from the sale of the rights gives the UK company 100% of the production budget for the movie and this sets the scene for the cash reimbursement. Is it me or does it sound like the way Joe Pesci in Lethal Weapon, was it Lethal Weapon 2? I think it was 2. Um, where he's describing um, how you launder money. <laughs> it sounds like it. Uh, but anyway, uh, so there we go, there's a diagram. I can't be bothered reading that. Uh, that's too, There's too many arrows for me. US studio, UK production company, give it a loan. Uh, is there interest on that loan? Don't know. They're on, they give the film rights back uh, loan repayment repay that back is there interest, is it an interest free loan <sighs> and then the government gives them 25.5 which is just happens to be the same amount of the budget <laughs> so the loan is equivalent to the tax back, that's what they're trying to say isn't it oh dear Loans are not counted as revenue because they need to be repaid. The UK production company, therefore, makes a loss equivalent to around 25.5% of the movie's budget. That is when the UK government steps in as it reimburses this loss. It's all very dodgy, isn't it? As the amount of the reimbursement is equivalent to the loan that the company owes its parent, the cash can be passed to the Hollywood studio as repayment. Thanks to these twists and turns, the UK government covers 25.5% of a film's costs, thereby reducing the studio's net spending. That doesn't mean the film's starting to make money, though. 
The cash that the studio pays for the rights to the movie is the revenue shown in the UK company's financial statements, even though they're all technically the same company. It's just it's moving papers about, isn't it? That's all it is. Uh, statements and crucially its expenses are the film's total costs the biggest component of the production costs is usually shown in the financial statements under the category of cost of sales whilst that word, while the administrative, uh, administrative expenses largely represent fees to auditors as well as a loss or gain from currency conversions it's all like uh, I don't know all the Canadian blah 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 <laughs> It's all too but com- complicated for my stupid, as I said before, my ape's brain. Oh dear. I still don't see how they're going to make money though. Because uh, all these people have to be paid, aren't they? All these accountants and auditors and... I say, is, there, is there interest on that loan? Don't know. Don't know. These manoeuvres leave the UK company with a small net profit, which is usually equivalent to the production services fee from the studio. How long does this bloody article go on for? Oh, it's not much longer. According to the, the scrolling bar at the side that you can't see. Right. If uh, it isn't a profit in the conventional sense, uh, as it isn't generated by external revenue, the UK company is entirely owned by the Hollywood studio, so the profit is simply equivalent to some of its money, uh, which remains in its right hand rather than the left. Like I said, it's just shuffling papers on the desk, you know, that's all it is. It is important to stress that this profit is booked by the production company, which bears the cost of making the movie, but does not receive the revenue from theatre ticket sales. If that revenue doesn't cover the net spending by the production company, then the movie makes a loss in its theatrical run. If the revenue from theatre ticket sales exceeds the production company's net spending, then the movie makes a profit. Not necessarily, as I said, they haven't taken marketing into account. Which is precisely what happened with the rise of Palpatine. According to Box Office Mojo, uh, The Rise of Palpatine grossed $1.077 billion, but Disney didn't pocket all of it. The amount that the theatres pay to studios is known in the trade as a rental fee, and an indication of the typical level comes from film industry consultant Stephen Follows, who interviewed 1,235 film professionals in 2014, and concluded that, according to studios, theatres keep 49% of the takings on average. As I said, it varies, doesn't it? Because uh, you've got to take into account international sales as well, and that can vary wildly. Uh, this research lends weight to the widely established 50-50 split, which would give Disney $538.5 million from Rise of Palpatine. But, as I said, it's not a 50-50 split. You've got to take marketing into account. And they're not taking marketing into account. They're just talking about the production costs on the film. <sighs> Deducting the $485.6 million net spending from Disney's $538.5 million share of the box office gives it a profit of $52.9 million, but it doesn't. It, was, it wasn't enough to make the rise of Palpatine a force to be reckoned with, and Star Wars has stayed off the silver screen since then, because it lost money. I bet there were at least $100 million on marketing, and they're not taking that into account here. Uh, so it probably lost money. It probably lost over $50 million. Um, but anyway. Uh, instead being relegated to streaming shows, with the most popular being The Mandalorian. In 2026, Star Wars will return to theatres with the release of The Mandalorian and Grogu, uh, which follows up the streaming series, and I don't think that'll make money. Unless they change the title to something a bit more exciting. Uh, the Mandalorian and Grogu won't put bums on seats. They're going to have to call it something else. Star Wars, I don't know, Battle for the Force or something like that. You know, they'll have to give it some a bit of zip. I know Battle for the Force is rubbish. That just popped top of my head. Anyway. Earlier this week, it was reported that British film producer Simon Kinberg has been hired by Lucasfilm to develop the next trilogy of films in the Star Wars saga. Time will tell whether he can bring back the magic to the series or whether it is still far, far away. Drinking game, cold coffee. Eh, dear. She waited right to the end, didn't she, did Caroline? Caroline. So, yeah. Uh, so, I think she's got that a bit wrong. Because even though they did mention marketing further up, further up the article... 
uh, that's not taken into account in the production um, budget. Uh, that comes afterwards, doesn't it? Um, so, as I said, I bet it cost over a hundred million dollars in. Um, but that's just you know a, a, a guesstimate. It might be more. It might be less. But um, even well, let's say it were fifty million dollars then on on marketing. I bet it were a lot more than that because they usually say the the, the rule of thumb generally is that the marketing budget is often equal to the, the production budget. So if a movie costs $100 million, its marketing budget would also probably be $100 million, or thereabouts. Um, but I can't see him spending $500 million on marketing, so let's let's be generous to him. <laughs> and, um, and we'll say $100 million. It might be more. It could have been $200 million, for all I know. If it were $200 million, it's lost a hell of a lot of money. If it were $50 million, it could have made, then the movie could have made a couple of million space books. Wow. Big deal. But anyway. But I think the important thing to Hollywood, to Hollywood executives, they're not thinking about if the movie lost money overall. They're thinking about what they can put on a biography or what somebody's biography says to other executives so if they're saying J.J. Abrams brought this massive movie in under budget um, that's a you know a cool thing for him isn't it because oh, I can bring in a movie under budget uh, even if it's a massive blockbuster movie that costs hundreds of million dollars hundreds of millions of dollars not that the film lost money at the box office that's by the back. Just don't mention that bit. So there you go. So uh, I still think it lost money. Even though they're saying here it made $50 million, I think it still lost money. Uh, and I think uh, um, the other one as well, um, um, Last Jedi, um, that could have lost money as well, maybe. I don't know. That, that, that made more money, but not a lot more money. It made something like $1.2 billion, didn't it? So this is a chance that Last Jedi may have lost money. Um, but um, anyway so there we go a, a very dry <laughs> article but um, it teaches us a little bit about how um, the, the shuffle the figures around uh, in um, Hollywood accounting we know how how vague Hollywood accounting can be were it Lord of the Rings um, I think to this day, Warner Brothers claim that a lot of the Rings movies have never made a profit. Um, Peter Jackson were forced to sue them, wanted to get some money off them, because uh, they keep, keep you know, they're saying that you know, it, it didn't make a profit, so you're not you're not getting any royalties, or something along those lines, wasn't it? Um, so that's how corrupt, essentially, the Hollywood system is, the Hollywood um, financial system. So there we go. But um, I still think it lost money. Rise of Palpatine lost money, but it but it's a laugh. <laughs> it is it funny? It's a funny film. It's it, it is awful, but it is funny because it's so awfully stupid. Light speed skipping, stuff like that. It's just terrible. That bloody dagger. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just I'm thinking about the film. I might have to go watch it and just have a good chortle. Uh, but anyway, right. So we'll leave that there. We'll leave that there. So thanks for watching. Wherever you are, look after each other. And until next time, I'll see you there.